There was a state question on the ballot Tuesday that could cause some confusion. State question 558 asked the people's approval to implement a water development program in the state. The title, if not read carefully and understood, may lead some to think the question is approval of a new tax. It is not. It simply authorizes the state to distribute $25 million already appropriated. The need for the vote is because it authorizes state funds to be used to help cities and towns, and that is a change of our law. The money is already there, taken from last year's surplus. If approved, the money can be used to help cities and towns get financing to fix leaky water pipes in their community. It is the first step in a much needed water development program for our state's future. I'm not suggesting that you vote for the measure or against it, but I did not want you to go vote without a little explanation of the bill. It is not a tax increase. It will not lead to the budget being unbalanced because we already have a law that makes it mandatory to balance the budget. Vote your conscience, but make sure you know what you're voting for. Believe it or not, all state questions do not raise our taxes. This is Jack Ogle. It is difficult to analyze the recent national elections and probably too many people have already tried. But the total of all the analysis may well be that nothing has changed. There are a few more Democratic seats in the House, but for all practical purposes, things are just as they were. And the result of that is obvious. We are at the mercy of members of the two parties, just as we have always been. It's time that they stop playing little political games with their lives and start acting like the statesmen we hope we have elected. The State of the Union at this point is something we can no longer stand to be a political issue. Someone or some group must take the position of leadership and get something done. The time for political rhetoric, that's the polite term for lies, is over. No more can we tolerate the president telling us he's cut our taxes by 25%. Maybe he cut someone's taxes 25%, but it wasn't mine. I'll bet it wasn't yours. No longer can we tolerate the Democratic leadership trying to frighten the people with forecasts of doom for Social Security. It's a time that the people with a real sense of feeling for the future of this country take over and get things done. I think what the voters told the President and Congress is, we'll give you one more chance, but you better come through. This is Jack Ogle. As usual, the state questions on the ballot were defeated by the voters. Generally, it takes more than one try to pass a state question in Oklahoma, no matter what it is. Question 558, the water proposal, probably was the most important of the losers, but it'll be back. The bill was not a good one at best because it left an open end on levying of revenue. But it was better than nothing, and those of us who supported it were betting that we could alter it and control it as time went on. But we can do better than what was presented to the people, and maybe next time the bill will pass. Probably the cool of fall is a poor time to try to convince the voting public that we need to plan now for our future water needs. Maybe a better time would be in the heat of summer, after a dry year or so when the well actually does run dry. Somehow I believe such a proposal would have a lot better chance with thirsty voters. And we will get that chance because we will get thirsty because of the defeat of 558. This is Jack Ogle. We have three little dogs. One of them, a part poodle, part something or other, named Gabby, has taken it upon herself to become the defender of the household. That's her job. 
Each night, just before 10, she makes a check of the backyard, then comes in, settles down to watch the Carson show. About midnight, she makes one last check. Well, it was that midnight check a few nights ago that almost proved to be Gabby's downfall. Somewhere lurking just outside our fence was a black and white kitty cat, a striped black and white kitty cat that any country dog would have known was a skunk. But for a town dog, Gabby, that cat was a threat to the kingdom, and she immediately attacked, only to immediately retreat. A clean shot from the skunk caught her right between the eyes. She made a beeline to where her friends were in bed and proceeded to try to get rid of that terrible odor by rubbing it off on the bed sheets. Now believe me, folks, even as sound sleep, I can tell you when there's something in the air. Well, to shorten this long story, after the soap bath and the tomato juice soak and all the rest, Gabby began to smell like a dog again, which under the circumstances was good. Several bottles of house spray in a couple of days brought the house back to normal. But ever since, Gabby's been sitting by my typewriter. And I don't know whether she wants to write a letter of resignation from her job or apply for workman's comp. This is Jack Ogle. Cowboy Hall of Fame director Dean Crakel is threatening again. Now he says the state is not doing enough for the Hall of Fame. He tried that ploy a year or so ago and threatened to move the Hall of Fame to another state. It's almost as if Crakel thinks he has the last say over whether or not the Hall stays in Oklahoma. He demanded that the state buy a huge piece of property in the area and move out all the other businesses. Well, these are not good times for people to ask the state to spend taxpayers' money on things that are not of immediate priority, and Crakel must understand that. I would imagine that it would be difficult in these trying economic times to find another state that would be willing to sink the millions of dollars needed into a new facility. I'm sure that many other western states would like to have the Cowboy Hall of Fame, just as Oklahoma would like to keep it. But Dean Crakel must understand that there are other priorities for the people's money right now, his spoiled brat attitude that he wants everything handed on a silver platter and he wants it right now will not make friends for him or the Hall of Fame in this state. The facility is a great one indeed and one that the state should be proud of and support to the fullest. But like someone's already said, we don't want the Cowboy Hall of Fame to go, but it might be time for Dean Crakel to go. This is Jack Ogle. A real Oklahoman is one who knows the greatest horse race in history ended in Guthrie and not at Churchill Downs. A real Oklahoman can survive the rigors of today because they know the dreams for tomorrow can be reached. They see it happening all around them. They know the state was settled by opportunists and outlaws and ne'er-do-wells, but realize it was developed by realists and scholars and workers. A real Oklahoman knows that Sooners started out as the bad guys. They marvel in the fact that there are those living who have watched this state from its beginning. A real Oklahoman thinks Veal Oscar is the guy that takes care of the calves at the feedlot and that manual labor is an illegal immigrant. Real Oklahomans change what they can and refuse to believe there is anything that can't be made better, even Texans. They believe you need an airplane to get high and rocks to get stoned and when you ask where they're coming from, they'll name a county, not a philosophy. A real Oklahoman knows the Gettysburg Address is not 220 Northwest 5th. They have respect for the past, effort for the present, and unbounded dreams for the future. They recognize the challenge before them. They see the rewards for success, and they dare you to become part of it. A real Oklahoman thinks Will Rogers was the father of our country, the Civil War takes a back seat to the run of 89, and that heaven will have short grass, blackjack trees, and quarter horses. A real Oklahoman knows the Orange Bowl is for fun, the Cotton Bowl for Texans, and the Dust Bowl was God's warning. They think success is overcoming a third and long at Nebraska. They believe in God, family, the self-propelled combine, and a drill bit. 
but most of all, they believe in themselves. And real Oklahomans will tell you, if you think the first 75 years was something, just stick around, partner. You ain't seen nothing yet. This is Jack Ogle. Oklahoma farmers have made less money than any others in the nation in 1981. $14 per family average profit. And things are probably worse now. If this comes as a surprise to you, you haven't been hearing the crisis from the farm and you haven't been listening and reading, I'm sure that most of you have been aware of the plight of the fields and the farmers for some time. And even though you cannot see the decline in farm prices at the grocery store, the decline is there and it is critical. $14 per family average is a sin in this country, even in bad economic times. But what is even more frightening is the pattern that's being followed. If you've ever studied about the depression of the 20s and the 30s, you know that the farmers were in a depression years before the rest of the country. I do not want to be one of the so-called doomsdayers. Seems that's what you are called when you issue warnings or express caution. But the indicators are scary. The rapidly fluctuating stock market, the same as in the 1929 era. The increasing unemployment rate and high interest, the same as in 1929. And now the farmers being virtually broke, the same as 1929. And those who refuse to heed the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. This is Jack Ogle. It will likely be a long time before we determine exactly what the change in the Soviet leadership will mean. But if there's one lesson we've learned from history, it is that from leader to leader, the Soviet goal changes very little. There may be new suggestions and new proposals. There may even be some closing of the gap between the two major powers of the world. But in the long pull, the dedicated goal of the Soviets is world conquest, either ideologically or militarily. And we cannot lose sight of that fact. This has been the goal since the revolution, and though the Russian people were probably not aware of that during the revolutionary period, they may be not even be aware of it right now. But the truth is that a long-term aim of the Soviet leadership is, and always has been, world dominance. The thing we must keep in mind is that we are dealing with a very patient people. While we think in terms of year to year or election to election in this country, the Russian people think in terms of decade to decade. Where we have the upper hand is in truth, the fact that our people are given information about what is going on while the Soviet people remain mostly in the dark. And even more, we in this country have reached the point of recognizing our own propaganda. In Russia, all the people know is what they read in the newspapers, and all the newspaper prints is what their leaders want them to know. This is Jack Ogle. The latest flight of the Columbia has been overshadowed to some extent by other world happenings, but it was truly an historical event. This trip was the space age equivalent of the first airmail flight many years ago. Man has proven he can successfully carry commercial cargo into space and return again, just as that first short airmail flight was accomplished. Then the speed of transporting written information was revolutionary. And now, the placing in orbit of two communication satellites for the crew of the Columbia opens all sorts of new doors. 
It tells us that in the future we will indeed be able to build, man, and visit artificial objects in space. Space stations, if you please. And once that has been accomplished, then the universe has no bounds. To be able to launch vehicles from beyond the pull of Earth's gravity is like that first airmail flight starting at 4,000 feet instead of having to lift all that weight off the ground. This flight has been historic, and though we are reaching the point of considering such happenings almost commonplace, we have been fortunate to live during another step forward for mankind. This is Jack Ogle. Now comes the Peacekeeper. That's a new name for the MX missile the President wants to put out in Wyoming. I agree with the idea of increasing our military strength, and I am one of those that truly believes this country will never use our strength except in defense. We had every chance after World War II when the rest of the nations of the earth were weak and far behind us in military power. We were the only ones who had the bomb then, and if there was ever a time that world dominance would have come easily, it would have been in the late 40s. Looking back, maybe we should have been more aggressive then. But there was a reason our government did not do more at that time to solidify our position as a dominant world power. It was because we didn't want that, and the American people wouldn't stand for that. It has never been the nature of the people of this country to dominate through military might. Threaten, yes. Use economic pressure, yes. But to move on other countries with our sheer military strength goes against the basics of the American way of life. Korea and Vietnam are two examples. Both battles would have been so easy if we were inclined to destroy other nations and the people in them. That's why I feel safe with the MX missile program. It is indeed the peacekeeper. And unfortunately, strength is the only thing the other guy understands. This is Jack Ogle. Bell is asking for another rate increase. This one would double the rates for some users. The battle by Bell to get their rates higher and higher has been going on ever since the federal government let the new kids come in on the long distance block. The other private companies offer lower rates for LD calls and this has cut the income for AT&T so the idea is to spread that income loss over the regular users rate. Indeed the telephone company has a massive investment and is probably hard pushed to make the major profits that they have in the past. But aren't we all? At the same time, Telco was announcing they would ask for a rate increase. The word came down that Oklahoma farmers were averaging $14 yearly of family profit. And what hit me even harder was a story in the same newspaper that informed us that the telephone company has filed suit to get their state taxes reduced. I only hope they come to some settlement like, if they get their rate increased, then they should pay their taxes. If their tax suit is upheld, then they shouldn't need a rate increase. But any way it goes, it is the public that will get the screws again. And again, the squeeze comes from big business. This is Jack Ogle. You know, you'd think the Thanksgiving holiday would be one of the easiest to write about and talk about, but it isn't. For days now, I've been trying to find something clever or arty or nostalgic to say on Thanksgiving Day. Now, that's not quite right. I haven't been thinking about it for days. I've been thinking about it for years. All the nice things have already been said. 
We can all be thankful for peace, threatened as it is. We can be thankful that we lived in a free economy, economically troubled as we are. We can be thankful for health and our loved ones and for the turkey that gave his life to add pleasure to ours. Now that's about as trite as you can get. We can think of past Thanksgivings and other dinners and relatives we've not seen for a long time, but those Thanksgivings, unlike memorable Christmases in the past, have a different place in my foggy memory. Somehow all I can remember are all those hot, sweaty women in the kitchen. So after these days, yes, even years, of trying to come up with something new for Thanksgiving, I've decided on this. This year I won't say anything about it at all. This is Jack Ogle. There is some sort of revolt going on, I understand. It seems that some, probably only a few people, have found something else to condemn our society for. It is future debt, the debt that we leave our children. It is said that every child born in this country today owes about $19,000 the minute they arrive. Well, that's probably true. But you know what they owe it for is a way of life that's been bought at a much higher price than that. It's called progress a term some people apparently either refuse to understand or refuse to respect. Through all these years of mankind, not only the history of this country, there has been great sacrifice to attain the level of civilization we've reached. Now this is when skeptics say, oh yes, civilization. We've learned how to blow up the whole world in one day. Well, my answer is yes, we have. We've also learned how to go to the moon and how to grow cross country without getting our feet muddy, how to soar in the air with the eagles, and how to put bread on the table without using your wife and kids to pull the plow. You know, we've even learned how to give that baby who will owe $19,000 an almost 100% chance of surviving the rigors of birth. That is called progress, and it comes through research, and that costs money. And if the youngsters born today owe $19,000, it's well worth it because their offspring will probably owe more than that and we'll be paying it for a better world and a better way of life. This is Jack Ogle. It's been said that football is the fans' way of venting pent-up anger, that it is an uncontrolled war, the Lions and the Christians, maybe. Well, that could be. But it seems that more and more the pent-up anger of the fans is breaking out. The spectacle at the OU Nebraska game recently is an example. After many years of observing the Big 8 football conference, I now have to say that the worst fans in the conference belong to Nebraska. There was a time that the fans at OU were in line for that honor, not because of violence or rowdiness, but rather because of fan demands and poor sportsmanship. Now Nebraska is the unchallenged leader in fan misbehavior. The incident in Nebraska after the game was dangerous. The fact that some five people were injured proves that. OU coach Barry Switzer was knocked down, as well as at least one of the OU players. Well, we can blame it on the fans all we want, but it is really the fault of the institution. The school, and yes, the state, must take responsibility for the security of the people both in the games and at the games. It's not uncommon to read of people being killed in riots at soccer games in other countries. and We cannot let football reach that point. A few years ago, a high school basketball game here in the city area was played behind closed doors. No fans, because earlier there had been trouble between the two schools. I would hate to see the doors locked at football stadiums because then we would really be at the mercy of TV. This is Jack Ogle.
I recently went through a winter storm power outage and it proved to me that I am totally unprepared for winter emergencies. When the ice hits the wires and the electricity goes, most of us are at the mercy of the elements. No power, no heat, if you have central heating systems. You can find a source of heat if you happen to have a fireplace or a gas stove in the kitchen, but generally, when the power goes down, everything goes down in this electrical world we live in. So there are a few things you might think about to prepare for such an emergency. A portable battery-powered radio keeps you in touch with the world. Some kind of auxiliary heating is a must, and there are a lot of them available now. Flashlights are better yet a small power generator will brighten things a lot. There are several small generators on the market now that will light a light or fire up the old TV set. But most of all, warmth is the problem. If you decide to start up the car and run the heater for a while, be sure you get out of the garage and be sure you have a window cracked for fresh air. And one more thing, if you're traveling in threatening weather, don't let the gas tank get below half a tank. Be sure to have some warm clothing and blankets in the trunk. Most of all, use your head. If you're stranded, don't start walking unless you see where you're going. A lot of people have died a few steps from help because they couldn't find it because they didn't know it was there. This is Jack Ogle. Cosell's public condemnation of boxing may help. Something indeed needs to be done, and I am a fight fan. But it's obvious that the time is near to make some changes in the sport. Those in the business claim it is the violence that the people come to watch. If it is, then the sport is no longer a sport. If the attraction is the skill and the technique, then safeguards are as appropriate for the pros as they are for the amateurs. Headgears would certainly be one step in the right direction, but the real answer is in promotion and management. The business is indeed laced with those who care for nothing except the dollar. But in defense of boxing, it is not the world's deadliest sport. It is third to auto racing and to football. But by the same token, it is the only sport where the basic object is to give the other guy a concussion. And even more, the people in football and auto racing are always trying to do things to make their sports safer. From a fan standpoint, as I recall, the TV ratings for the Olympics in Montreal that produced the likes of Sugar Ray Leonard had very high ratings, and international rules call for using headgears and standing eight counts and a lot of other things. The recent Holmes Randy Cobb butchery in Houston pointed out the problems of the people in boxing. It was obviously a mismatch and should have been stopped, but while Cosell was slandering the referee for not ending it, he failed to place the blame where it should have been, in Cobb's corner. Carrying people truly interested in the sport and in the fighters would have stopped the fight in Cobb's corner. This is Jack Ogle. President Reagan has agreed to make a loan of over a billion dollars to Brazil to help out the economic problems there. Now the first reaction must be, we need the help here too. A billion dollars could go a long way toward creating jobs in this country. But Brazil is likely the most important country in the Americas as far as our security is concerned. Many years ago, the Soviet Union blocked out countries in various sections of the world in order to name their importance to communist world domination. Well, the decisions were based on, first, military strategic location, second, the political influence in the country's particular part of the world, and third, the economic potential of the area. Brazil was established by the Soviets as the key nation in South America. So far, that country has held the line against communism and remains a good friend and an ally to the United States. Brazil has been and will continue to be an important figure in the constant skirmishes in other South American countries 
the communist attempt to take over there. But economically troubled people are subject to take over. And if we are to maintain our hold on South America, we must have a strong Brazil. This is Jack Ogle. This past lame duck Congress should have taught someone a lesson. It might be that sessions of this nature should be limited in the actions they can take. The problem is this. Many of the members are simply filling out their terms. They were defeated in the last election or have decided not to run again. Whatever, they may well have lost their interest. The five cent a gallon gas tax the Congress kicked out is a good example. In the House, the bill was passed by barely 40% of the people sent there by the voters. Almost 60% voted against it or were not there to vote at all. Now this seems to be something less than the representation the forefathers had in mind. I'm not speaking for or against the gas tax, but rather against letting a minority of our representatives pass such an important measure. 